Healthcare Money Campfire Stories by Eric Bricker, MD. Chapter 1 The Road to Happiness, R O A D. I want to be a radiologist, said Bruno. He was one of my fellow first year medical students. We were in medical school orientation. It was August of 2000. Our entering class of about 200 people sat at circular tables in a giant conference hall in our medical school's student union building. While sitting at the tables, we would listen to various speakers. The dean, a senior cardiologist, the head of student affairs, etc. In between sessions, there was time for chatting. The subject of break time chat was frequently what type of doctor each student wanted to be. Having no one in my family in medicine, I did not know that the type of doctor that you were had profound impacts on your lifestyle. I was naive. Having the most desirable lifestyle as a doctor meant, one, a high income, two, fewer overall hours of work, three, less work on weekends and holidays, and four, less time being on call overnight with a pager. It was not so much what you were doing as much as how to get paid the most for the least amount of time. Bruno proceeded to educate me. To maximize these four characteristics of lifestyle, the specialties of radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, and dermatology were at the top. They provided the most income for the least amount of work, weekends, and overnight call. They formed the acronym ROAD, or ROAD, and were known as the Road to Happiness. The next tier down included orthopedic surgery, ENT, urology, neurosurgery, cardiology, gastroenterology, general surgery, and the other surgical subspecialties. These were the proceduralist specialties in that the doctors performed a lot of procedures that tended to be well compensated. These doctors made a lot of money, but they had a lot of work hours, including overnight, weekends, and holidays. The next tier down were all the other internal medicine specialties such as nephrology, oncology, and endocrinology. Also included in this tier were other specialties such as OBGYN, emergency medicine, and pathology. These specialties did not have as much money as the proceduralists. The bottom tier were pediatrics, general internal medicine, family practice, and psychiatry. In other words, primary care and mental health. These specialties had almost no procedures and dealt a lot with talking to patients, which takes a long time. Talking means less visits per day and less money. Their patients were mostly on Medicare or Medicaid as well. Medicare and Medicaid tend to reimburse doctors less than commercial insurance. So not only did these bottom tier doctors see fewer patients, but they were also paid less per patient too. With that final comment, Bruno was done with his explanation. I looked around the table at the other new medical students who were listening. They all nodded in agreement. How do you know all this? I asked. My dad's a cardiologist. My mom's an oncologist. Everyone knows this. Aha, now I was getting it. The lifestyle implications of each specialty were passed on from parent doctor to child doctor. That's understandable since these children had to grow up in a household with a physician and saw firsthand the impact of their parents' chosen specialties on their families. This hierarchy of physician specialties has some unintended consequences on the practice of medicine itself. The most desirable tier one specialties had the most competitive residencies. Therefore, the smartest students in medical school at the top of their class entered these areas. Tier 2 then had the next smartest batch of people. Tier 3 had the next cohort. Tier 4 had what was left. Of course, it's more complicated than that. To become a cardiologist or a gastroenterologist, one must do a residency in internal medicine first and then additional training in a specific cardiology or gastroenterology fellowship. Accordingly, there were Tier 2 level medical students who applied to internal medicine residencies, which are Tier 4, as part of their required progression to become specialists. Also, some incredibly bright medical students may have a calling to work with children and so become pediatricians, even though they could have been dermatologists. Everyone in medical school knows this. As a result of this hierarchy, the perception within the practicing physician community is that Tier 4 doctors are not as smart as the higher tiers. Tier 1 and Tier 2 and Tier 3 tend to look down on Tier 4 clinically. 
which means their judgment as a specialist regarding a patient supersedes that of the primary care physician. They will probably not admit this. They may not even believe it themselves, but it still subconsciously impacts their medical decision making. This hierarchy is a problem because the higher tier specialists do not deal with the entire person. They only address one organ or part of the body, sometimes at the expense of the other parts of the body. Helping the heart can hurt the kidneys. Taking a patient to orthopedic surgery can risk damage to the brain under anesthesia. A person may be in pain because they are depressed and no amount of surgery is going to help their depression. It's the tier four primary care and mental health doctors that typically think about the patient holistically. The very same doctors who are at the bottom of the doctor food chain. Again, of course, there are exceptions. There are holistically thinking cardiologists and orthopedic surgeons. However, they are the exception rather than the rule, in my opinion. Lesson learned. A potential component behind the over-testing, over-diagnosis, and over-treatment of patients in America is the specialist-driven hierarchy among doctors. The do-more specialists are on top. Somewhat obscurely, it is a hierarchy of intelligence rooted in money and lifestyle. Chapter 2. This is all fluid. During my third year of medical school, my first clinical rotation was general internal medicine at the Westside VA in Chicago. The rotation was three months in total, one month of outpatient clinic and two months of inpatient hospital wards. As part of the outpatient clinic portion, medical students were to go on house calls with a VA nurse and medical assistant as part of a home care program. As one can imagine, the program was intended to reach veterans who, for various reasons, could not make it to the outpatient clinic at the hospital. Lack of mobility was the most common reason. I met with the nurse and assistant at the hospital, and the three of us got into a teal Ford Taurus with the letters VA painted on the two front doors. We then drove about 45 minutes south to visit a patient who had hypertension, diabetes, and congestive heart failure, CHF. He had been discharged from the hospital about one month ago for what is called a CHF exacerbation. In brief, his heart was not pumping strong enough to move the same amount of blood out as was returning. As a result, the veins become backed up and pressure builds in the microscopic capillaries, the smallest branches of the circulatory system. Eventually, the exacerbation occurs when the fluid part of the blood, not the red blood cells, is pushed out of the bloodstream because the increased pressure into the tissues of the body. There is excess fluid in the lungs, making it hard to breathe, and excess fluid in the legs, making it hard to walk or even stand. To treat the CHF exacerbation, the patient is given intravenous, IV, diuretic medication that causes the kidneys to filter out excess fluid, which the patient then urinates out of their body. Days or weeks later, enough fluid has been removed so that the patient can be switched to pill diuretic medications and discharged from the hospital. Our Ford Taurus arrived at a collection of two-story row houses. They were across the street from a field of overgrown grass that was filled with trash. Each row house had a small front yard with patches of dirt mixed with overgrown grass, all full of litter too. Some of the windows were covered with plywood. A thin dog trotted across the parking lot. It was a poor part of town. We walked up to the door. The medical assistant knocked. The nurse and I were behind her. A short, thin woman in jeans and an untucked flannel shirt opened the door. She did not make eye contact, turned, and walked back into the house. She did not say anything. No hello, no who are you. The medical assistant and the nurse followed her. So did I, reluctantly. The front door led directly to what looked like a family room. There was brown wood paneling on the walls, two light brown torn and stained sofas, a coffee table covered with several plates with half-eaten food on them, paper towels, and an ashtray, and an old TV playing a daytime show. It was dim. Curtains were drawn over the front window. It smelled musty and of body odor. The woman who let us in had not said a word. She continued through the family room to the back door. The room was small, but extended the depth of the home from front to back. There was a storm door 
out the back with a picture window next to it with the bars on the outside. She walked out the storm door and was no longer visible. The sun was in the east on the back side of the house. My eyes had started to adjust to the darkness of the home so that it seemed even brighter outside than normal. Immediately to our left, while facing the back door, was a narrow staircase up to the second floor with brown, worn carpeting. I'm coming, we heard the raspy voice of a middle-aged man coming from upstairs. We turned and faced the upstairs, waiting to see the man behind the voice. First, we just saw the feet, bare, swollen, and massive. Next, we saw the legs, then midsection, and arms as he steadied himself with the wooden railing. It shook every time he grabbed it. He was wearing gray sweatpants that had been cut into shorts. He had no shirt. He walked down sideways with his left foot stepping one step down and his right foot then following to the same step. He was the most obese person I had ever seen. We soon came to find out he weighed over 900 pounds. He reached the bottom. We said hello. Thank you for coming, he replied. He said his name was Maurice. Come on upstairs. After watching him precariously come down the stairs, I said to myself, there is no way he was going to make it back up. But he did, breathing heavily. The medical assistant followed, then the nurse, then me. The staircase led directly to a bedroom that faced the front of the house. It had an oversized old metal hospital bed, mattress, no sheets, and a balled-up cream-colored comforter pushed to the side. There was a small wooden dresser, more wood paneling on the walls, a brownish light fixture overhead, and trash everywhere. The entire home was in squalor. He sat on the edge of the bed. The nurse and medical assistant asked him how he was doing and began to question him regarding his recent hospitalization, discharge, and care at home. On the day Maurice went to the hospital, he had suddenly been unable to breathe and called 911. He was so large that the ambulance crew could not lift him into the vehicle. They had to call the police and another ambulance crew to help. He said eventually about a dozen people were able to get him into the ambulance, which then drove him to the West Side VA. Maurice paused. The nurse tried to check his blood pressure, but the cuff would not even come close to fitting around his arm. She stopped trying. He had a panis, the fat hanging off the front of his body, that was about the size of a kitchen table for four. They pricked his finger to check his blood sugar. It read 132 on the glucometer. A little high, but not bad. We continued to talk. Maurice was born and raised in Chicago. At 18, he was drafted into the Army and sent to the Vietnam War. He pulled out a small picture frame with a photo of him at 18 in a suit and tie with a woman in a wedding dress. It was his wedding photo. In the picture, he was handsome, smiling, a little over six feet tall, and thin. A picture of perfect health. After serving in Vietnam, he married this woman from his neighborhood. The marriage lasted about a year. He said he saw things in Vietnam you couldn't imagine. He turned to drugs and alcohol to help him forget. His wife left him. He became very depressed, and he ate. Maurice then remarried and divorced two more times, and is now married to his fourth wife, the woman who let us in. They have been married for two years. He received a check every month from the army, and he knew that that was why she married him. He no longer drank or did drugs. He had even lost 100 pounds, he said, by eating a strict diet of only vegetables and soup. In other words, he used to be over 1,000 pounds. He said he knew because the scale on the bed at the VA hospital. He was in the hospital about a year ago, and it measured over 1,000 pounds then. On this most recent trip, it measured in the 900s, according to him. This is all fluid, Maurice explained. It was not all fluid. It was mostly fat. What do you do with yourself? The nurse asked. He pointed to an old, open, black suitcase lying on the floor. It was filled with neatly arranged rows of hand-labeled cassette tapes. I make mixtapes, Maurice replied. On the dresser, there was a dual cassette deck boombox. He listened to the radio and recorded songs that he liked. He also recorded from tape to tape. His face had been expressionless the whole time, but his voice brightened a little. I've got some real good ones in there. We examined Maurice. 
He lied on his side on the bed. The medical assistant and I pulled back his penis as far as we could. It probably weighed over 100 pounds itself. The nurse checked the skin underneath and found it moist and raw from a yeast infection, a common problem in the skin folds of very obese people. She applied some antifungal powder to the best of her ability. We'll leave the powder here. Do you have anyone to help you do this? She asked. No, Maurice answered. After more questions and more examination, we wrapped up our house call. The nurse told Maurice to have less soup and to switch to low, the low-sodium kind. All the salt in the soup he ate probably caused his CHF exacerbation. Maurice was trying to do the right thing and losing weight. He had no idea that soup had complicated his heart problem. Are you depressed, Maurice? The nurse asked. Yes, Maurice answered. He was not taking any antidepressant medication and had not seen a psychiatrist in over a decade. Would you like help with your depression? Continued the nurse. No, it's no use, he replied. The nurse asked Maurice if he would consider seeing a counselor. He said he would think about it. The nurse told him the VA would come out and see him again in another month. We turned to leave and walked past Maurice's wife, who had just come upstairs. Again, she said nothing, did not make any eye contact with us or Maurice, walked into the back bedroom, and shut the door. Lesson learned. If our thoughts are ill, our bodies will follow. If our families are ill, our bodies will likely follow too. No amount of care, medicine, money, or quote-unquote healthcare system change will heal our bodies unless we begin to heal our thoughts and our families.